Brenda, Sally, these songs prepared us for tonight, didn't they? He is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. What does it say? Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we have come tonight because we have confessed him as Lord and Savior, amen? And we come to celebrate this Monday, Thursday service. And uh, I hope you picked up your communion container. If not, they're in the foyer of the church. But we'll celebrate that in just a little while. And another thing that Jesus taught his disciples is to be servants. And so, and, and I realize this is not the highest attendance service in the, in the church, but foot washing. And we believe that that Jesus instructed us to do that, and the ladies will meet in the heritage room. And if you want to come and just observe, that is fine. You don't have to have your feet washed. And the guys will meet in the choir room. So that'll be after this service is over. So reflect on what Jesus has done for you. Reflect on his goodness. Reflect on the pain that he suffered. But reflect also that on Easter... He rose from the dead. Amen. Heavenly Father, what a special night to come and quiet our hearts and spirits with these beautiful candles. The cross, which is symptomatic of the cross that you were crucified on. And Lord, we come tonight with grateful hearts because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we have confessed him. Thank you, Father, that we can come tonight, and we pray that this will help us to be more prepared than ever. Number one, share the good news of Jesus Christ. And number two, to make sure we're ready to meet the Lord when he would call us home. We pray that your spirit would watch over us, that would challenge us, would bless us, and remind us of the tremendous cost of our salvation. We love you, Lord. We praise you, for we ask it in Jesus' powerful and precious name. Amen and amen. If you feel led, would you please stand as we join in worship?
know, normally when we do services, it, we sing, and then it seems like everything leads up to the preacher. And several years ago, when Daniel and I first started wor working together, uh, we were talking about that. I said, remember, Daniel, Jesus is the center of the service, not the sermon. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's easy to think that, and today we're actually switching. I just want to take a few minutes to set the stage. I want the worship to be the center of your service today. And I want communion to be the center, this focal point of the cross of Christ tonight. I have one truth that I want to uh, show you and illustrate you by way of the way Jesus illustrated it to you. And the truth is simple. It goes like this. It says, to be a mercy giver is to be a debt payer. To be a mercy giver is to be a debt payer. In Matthew chapter 18, Peter comes to Jesus. And he says, Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I tell you not seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And to this, Jesus begins to tell a parable. He says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with one of his slaves. And when he had begun to settle one of them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, the Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife, with his children, and all that he had to be used in repayment of the debt. We read over this quite simply because we see the word 10,000, and when it refers to the currency that we have, we would think, you know, how big could it be? The biggest bill we have is a $100 bill. But a talent was roughly 15 years' wages for the common worker. So if you do the math for the minimum hour wage job today, $12 an hour working 40 hours a week, approximately $25,000 a year, each talent would be worth about $375,000. The debt is 10,000 talents. The debt is approximately $3.7524 billion. And this shows us a couple things. First, this servant was entrusted with a lot of tremendous value. And the second one is, he blew it bad. He blew it bad. Verse 26. So, so the slave fell on the ground and prostrated himself, before, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience on me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him of that debt. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. He got on his knees and asked for mercy. He only actually asked for more time, which how many lifetimes would that take? We don't know. And in a moment, this mismanaged, misspent, this money that was lost, it was gone. In one act of mercy, he restored that man's life and his family's life. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who had owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him, and he began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe me. So this fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went out and he threw him in prison until he should pay back what he had owed. So this debt of talents, a talent is worth 15 year's wages. How much do you suppose a denarii is worth? One day. One day's wages. So a hundred days wages was the debt. Roughly nine or ten thousand dollars by the same standards. Peanuts in terms of what he had forgiven. So why could this man who was forgiven so much not forgive so little? The answer is very simple. Because it wasn't little to him. $10,000 is a bit of money to most of us, regardless of what you make. And what this slave knew is that 
forgiving him was not going to be an easy thing to do because if I forgive him of that $10,000, if I forgive him of that 100 denarii, guess what I am not getting back? I am not getting back my 100 denarii. You see, for him to give mercy was not free. It was free for the one who received mercy, but it is anything but free for the one who gives it. Because to be a mercy giver is to be a debt payer. And in this case, he would have to absorb the loss. Follow me here. He would have to pay back unto himself what was taken from him. It wouldn't simply go away. The debt would be transferred to himself. The cost to forgive this other servant of his was about $10,000 or 100 denarii, and he was simply unwilling to pay the cost of mercy. If you have ever forgiven anybody, you know that mercy is not free. Because the act is, is when someone takes something from you that you know you're not going to get back. You know, we're talking about money here. Someone, I had a friend in high school. I was about ready to travel across the country We had gone to the bank together so I could get cash. I was 16 years old going to Washington, D.C. by myself, basically. And when I got there, the money in my wallet was gone. The friend that I went stole the money from me. Real sweet, right? He took something that didn't belong to him. But to forgive him was to cost me. But the same thing's true with anything else, isn't it? People taking from you what's not yours, what's not theirs to take. You know, if someone lies to you, What do they take from you? They take from you the truth. They take from you your trust. If someone has abused you, they've taken from you your safety, your value, your dignity as a human being. And you say you forgive them, you know that that cost you something because that wasn't just free. Someone took something from you that belonged to you. And whether you've been manipulated or slandered, misrepresented, treated unfairly, taken advantage of, the list goes on. Someone took something for you, and you know that to be a mercy giver is a debt payer because while it may be free for them to say, I forgive you, you know it cost you something because you felt the pain of it. You felt being robbed from. And sometimes the cost to forgive is small. It's a misunderstanding. It's a, it's a raised voice in the midst of a conversation that we apologize for and we move on. Maybe it's a promise that was unkept that's not that big of a deal, but sometimes it's really big, isn't it? Sometimes it's really big. Unfaithfulness in marriage, losing of a pension, betrayal, abandonment, the list goes on. And anybody who's forgiven, anybody knows this. Forgiveness comes at great cost to the one who is forgiving. Verse 31. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved, and they came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. And summoning him, the Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you of all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you have not also had mercy on the fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? Let me say it this way. Should you have not also paid the debt just like I paid the debt for you? And the Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed to him. For my heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount, and the focus of this evening is, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And tonight is is the night where we really reflect on mercy. And we see Jesus' point here because what this man, he understood how much it was going to cost him to forgive somebody else, but he didn't fathom how much it cost his master to forgive him. He didn't fathom how much it cost the master to give him. What he had to give away was of value, but what his master had to give away was not of value to him. Because for the master to have mercy on the slave, think about this, for the master to have mercy on the slave, he would have to pay back unto himself the debt that the slave had taken to the tune of $3.75 billion. For the master to forgive his servant, As anybody that owns a business knows, when someone loses your money, they lose your money. 
It doesn't just vanish into thin air. And this act of forgiveness was to be a debt payer. For to be a mercy giver is to be a debt payer. And when someone, when you give someone mercy, church, it will cost you because you will be a debt payer. Tonight, this is what I want you to reflect on. As we read some scriptures, as we think about Christ on his way to the cross and on the cross, as we take communion together, I want you, I want you to visualize this, that this is what it costs Jesus to have mercy on you. To be a mercy giver is to be a debt payer. And if you've ever forgiven anybody, you know the cost. I want you to know this was what it cost our master and our Lord to have mercy on us. This is how much he loves you, that he was willing to pay this great a price to have mercy on you. So as we uh, prepare for communion, as we worship, as we listen to scriptures tonight, um, I want to invite you to be reflective, and I also want to invite you to be grateful for the price that was paid for you. Let's pray. Father God, as we, uh, as we come to you and reflect on the debt payment that Jesus had for us, I ask that it would sink in deeply, that your mercy is not free, that it costs you your life, and not just any old death, but death on a cross. That we were worth more than the payment to you, and you gladly bore it on our behalf. May your name be praised tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll start with the scripture of Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and, he did not, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Would you please stand if you feel so led? Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior. So oh. 
John 12, 25 through 28. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. There came therefore a voice out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. How deep. The Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His Matthew 27, 11 through 26. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge, so that the governor was quite amazed. Now 
at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the multitude any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they were holding at that time a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. When therefore they were gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that because of envy they had delivered him up. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the multitudes to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he was not accomplishing anything, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the multitude, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he delivered him to be crucified. O oh, sacred head, now wounded with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded. Matthew 27, 27 through 45. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered his whole Roman cohort around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they kneeled down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him. And they took the reed and began to beat him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took his robe off and put his garments on him and led him away to crucify him. 
And as they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. And they went, when they had come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mingled with gall. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And they put up above his head the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. You are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we shall believe in him. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him now. If he takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers also who had been crucified with him were casting the same insults at him. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. Jerusalem that day the soldiers tried to clear that narrow street but the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die at Calvary he was bleeding from a beating there were stripes upon his back and he wore a crown of thorns upon his head. And he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death. Down the Via Dolorosa, called the way of suffering, like a lamb came the Messiah, Christ the King. Los soldados le abren paso a Jesús, mas la gente se acerbaba para ver a quien llevaba que a cruz. Por la vía dolorosa, que es la vía del dolor, como que ha sido Cristo, Rey Señor. Y fue el quien quiso morir por su amor, por ti, por mí, por la vida dolorosa al caballo. Oh, 
suffering Oh, can the Messiah Christ the King But he chose to walk that road Out of his love for you and me Down the Via Dolorosa All the way After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Over the next few minutes, we're going to take communion together. Um, if you don't know how to use this, ask the person next to you. Make sure you clear the, tear the clear one off the top. Don't go yet, because... Um, I'm going to have you take communion on your own or with the person next to you. Um, Brooke and Christy, you're going to pray, play for us a little bit. And I was, I was thinking, you know, I don't know how fast, of course it's a parable, so it's not really true, but I don't know how fast this guy went and turned around and found his fellow slave and wrung his neck and, and lost the gift that his master had given him. But I wonder what it would have been like for him as a, as a person that has overseen that much. You know his office has papers everywhere and contacts everywhere and backlogs everywhere. And every day he walks into that office and he just sees an impossible pile that I'll never get through. And after, to walk into that office and it was empty. As we take communion today, I want you to walk into your office and remember what was there that was taken away because the mercy giver is your debt payer. So over the next few minutes, as you will, in your own space, with you and with the Lord, take communion together.
It's our closing song. If you do feel led to stand, I'll invite you to do that. But if you want to remain seated, I understand that as well. There's a place where mercy close and Daniel's going to hang out and play. If you want to have a conversation, I ask that you don't have it in here. This room will remain open. And if you got business to deal with with the Lord, tomorrow's not the day to do it. Today's the day. Today's the day. And his mercy is your debt payer. And so we're just going to keep this room as it is. And if you're going to exit, exit out the back in about 10 minutes. So it's 7.30 now in about 10 minutes. The ladies will meet in the heritage room. The men will meet. Of course, this is optional. And you can observe. If you don't want to participate, we'd still love to have you. The men will meet back here in the choir room to uh, practice foot washing together. But as we close, I just invite you to say this with me. 
for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know the one that goes behind it? For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The mercy giver is our debt payer. Amen. Lord bless.